I'm a Bloomberg Fellow. I am a Bloomberg Fellow. I'm a Bloomberg Fellow. And I'm a Bloomberg Fellow. I'm a Bloomberg Fellow. And I'm a Bloomberg Fellow. I'm a case manager for people living with hepatitis C. Director of Suicide Prevention. Historian and preservationist. Detective with the Threat Response Unit. An attending physician in the emergency department. I work at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Bronx Connect. Fort Lauderdale Police Department. Get Healthy Philly. The Hawaii Department of Health. Food and Water Action. I became a fellow to make sure addiction is seen as a disease. I hope to do my part in ending youth homelessness. I became a fellow to find new ways to address the effects of vacancy and abandonment. I hope to reshape the food system to promote community and ecological health. I became a fellow to strengthen primary prevention of human trafficking. I hope to collaborate toward solutions that are bigger and smarter than what we are up against. To promote social justice for people who use drugs in marginalized communities. To promote mental health and decrease risk among minority youth. To help reduce our nation's gun violence crisis. To attack the true root causes of unhealthy environments. Join us. Join us. As, as we, we work, work to save lives. lives and build a healthier future for our country. And build a healthier future for our country. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us today as we talk about the Bloomberg Fellows Program and our obesity and the food system focus area. Today, we'll be joined by Shane Bryan, our fellowship, our partnership engagement officer. Also, we'll be joined by um, my colleague, Faria Zaman, our fellowship officer. And my name is Shannon Jones, and I'm the marketing and communications um, events manager with the Bloomberg American Hope Initiative. We have some special guests with us today. Uh, we're excited to have one of our Bloomberg fellows, Susan Kornacki. Uh, Susan is with the Montgomery County Food Council, and we're so excited to have um, you a part of uh, this webinar today, Susan. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, no problem. Also, we have Heather Ruskin. Heather is the executive director with the Montgomery County Food Council as well. Um, and Heather, we are excited to, to hear from you today and to hear about the great things your organization is, is doing as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And lastly, we are joined by Eli Mui, who is our Bloomberg Assistant Professor of American Health here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us, Eli. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so as you are watching this webinar, we welcome questions. Um, please feel free to send your questions to Bloomberg Fellows, mph at jhu.edu. We'll be happy to address any questions or any concerns that you may think of along the, the um, viewing of this webinar. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the um, tables over to Faria and Shane. Wonderful, thank you so much, Shannon for those introductions. And it is a great pleasure to be with you all today. And um, for those of you who are tuning in and watching the recording on our YouTube page, thank you so much for your interest in the Bloomberg Fellows Program. Um, again, my name is Shane. And, and just to give you a sense, we're gonna talk about our focus area, our cross-cutting themes, the approaches to our work, and then we'll talk more specifically about the Bloomberg Fellows Program and the obesity and the food systems focus area, the reason that you are all here today. Uh, we'll go over how you can apply and some frequently asked questions. So just to give you a sense of what you're in for, um, we're excited and let's just jump in and start talking about our focus areas. All of our work here at the initiative is in five areas, addiction and overdose, adolescent health, obesity and the food system, environmental challenges and violence. And we take a broad approach for all of these areas. Today, we'll talk more about the obesity and the food system focus area, but to give you a sense, we're looking at the systems approaches to this area, thinking about the intersections of um, food, obesity, and how a built environment around the community affects individuals' access to healthy foods. 
Um, another example of how we kind of broaden the approach is looking at violence. Certainly we take into consideration gun violence, um, but also for us it's intimate partner violence, community-based violence, structural violence that's prevalent in communities. Um, and that's across all five of these areas. So we, we really look at um, the work that you all are doing in your communities and we wanna hear from you how your work fits into a particular focus area. So next, we're gonna talk about our cross-cutting themes. These three themes are, are prevalent in all of the work that we do, um, equity, evidence, and policy, ensuring that we're being mindful of the lived experiences and the communities where we are doing our work. Evidence in public health is all about the data, and we wanna ensure our policies are informed with that public health data using the lens that we are trying to um, provide through this fellowship program. Our approaches here at the fellowship and the, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative are also three-pronged. So we do research, practice, and education. And uh, for research, it's all about uh, the impact that we can make. We are looking for opportunities to fund faculty to work with communities and organizations across the country to create deliverables that can be replicated in other communities. So a policy, a program, a toolkit maybe. Uh, for practice, that's where we're able to support 25 faculty, five in each of the focus areas, to work in these particular um, areas of expertise. So Eli, we're so excited. Um, you'll be able to hear more from her, but she's one of our Bloomberg American Health faculty who takes those innovative approaches, works with community collaboratively to address needs and trying to, to change the trajectory of health here in the United States. But I know you all have joined us today to learn more about our fellows program, and that's our educational approach. So Faria, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the Bloomberg Fellows Program? Thanks, Shane. Yes, I certainly do. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So the Bloomberg Fellows Program, it's a really, really unique type of scholarship program. It's impact-based, and it targets those individuals who are already working on the front lines of the five focus areas. The fellows, they focus their studies in their particular area, they engage with the organizations, and once they complete their MPH studies, they do one year of service obligation with their organizations. Now, um, I want to just tell you a little bit about uh, the kinds of organizations that we have as part of the fellowship program. First of all, any organization is eligible as long as they are based here in the United States and working in at least one of the five focus areas. And some of our organizations organizations range from um, a typical uh, public health department to public schools to libraries, legal clinics, and small community-based organizations. So really, um, anything is possible. And Shane, I thought you might want to elaborate a little bit on the National Network of Practice. Absolutely. And, and thank you for that, Faria. This National Network of Practice that we're building out here at the initiative consists of fellows, individuals from the School of Public Health and organizations. These are people who are working in these five focus areas on the front lines in communities all across the country. We are looking for both traditional and non-traditional organizations. Now what that means is when you think of a traditional public health organization, that's your health departments, um, more of the medical settings, but for non-traditional, as far as I mentioned, we have police officers, we're looking for urban planners, um, individuals who might not consider the work to be public health, but through the lens and training of public health can deepen and widen their impact. And that's what we're trying to do here with this network. We also have an annual convening that's called the Bloomberg American Health Summit. We bring together all the stakeholders of the initiative and we track the progress that we've made and make goals for the future. This is a very high impact, high energy couple of days, not your typical conference, but really a convening that brings together the thought leaders across the country in these five focus areas and three cross-cutting themes. So that's the national network and we have our full-time and part-time opportunity, which Fari, I think you can talk more about that, right? Yep. So uh, the fellowship is open to individuals who are interested in pursuing the MPH program, either part time or on a full time basis. So the full time program is 11 months right here um, in Baltimore on campus. We have five eight week terms that run from June till May. And as I mentioned, um, the degree uh, on a full-time basis can be completed in 11 months. 
Um, we're also open to those individuals who'd like to apply to the MPH program um, as a part-time student. And for part-time, um, the classes uh, can be accessed online from anywhere in the country and almost all of the classes are available online. It typically takes two to three years to complete the MPH on a part-time basis and students have a maximum of four years to complete it. And typically our fellows take uh, roughly one to three courses per term. And as I mentioned, um, each term is about eight weeks in length. And I wanted to just um, show everyone a sampling of um, some of the courses that are offered, particularly in the obesity and food systems focus area. And, and as you can see, we have many interesting courses ranging from food, culture, and nutrition to nutritional epidemiology that our students can select from. And speaking of, I would love to introduce one of our amazing fellows, Susan Koronaki from the Montgomery Food Council. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for being here. Susan, Hi. I thought it would be nice if you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the courses that you've taken and um, you know what you found interesting or useful about them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Faria. Thank you for including me. And thank you to the initiative for this opportunity to talk about my experience as a fellow. I appreciate it. Um, so the slide that you just shared, Faria, includes some of the courses that I've had the opportunity to take here. Um, case studies in food production and public health has been a really fabulous learning opportunity and actually speaks to many of the topics that brought me to food systems work. Um, my background is in environmental programs and sustainability, um, primarily through a community level program lens, but also thinking a little bit about county and state level policy. Uh, but my work with the Montgomery County Food Council was what really engaged me in system-wide work and helped me think more critically about the environmental impact of our food system, as well as the nutritional and health benefits that a thriving, healthy, equitable food system can provide. Um, and the role of production within all of that is something that's really fascinating to me. And Keeve Nackman's class has been a really wonderful learning opportunity. Um, food and nutrition policy was also a really positive learning experience. Um, that was a course where, um, as I have found with many of my classes here at Hopkins, I had the opportunity to hear from experts and professionals, advocates and decision makers from every level of government and from many different types of organizations um, doing advocacy and policy work with a variety of strategies and approaches to the work. Um, it was fascinating not only to hear their perspectives, but to also hear the questions of my peers and my classmates in that course who were similarly coming from a really wide range of backgrounds from nutritional education and dietary work all the way up to work at the federal level here in the US and in other countries as well. Um, so I found that to be a really engaging and fabulous course. Um, my health impact assessment class with Dr. Keisha Pollock Porter was also a really wonderful learning experience. She's a professor with the initiative um, and takes an approach to the work as we've talked about already in this webinar of making sure that um, community needs are considered in the design of her research questions and that the research that she is a part of really contributes and gives back to advocacy and to shaping a policy at a variety of levels in government. Um, her class was transformative for me because I've been looking for ways to better understand how I can be a useful conduit between the research community here at Hopkins and um, community level work happening in Montgomery County and throughout our region, um, particularly in a time like this when I think we're learning that organizations working on the front lines of public health work, particularly food systems work, we all need to pull together as much as we can and operate with a lot of teamwork and also with as much research and, um, and well-informed decision-making behind everything that we do. So I found health impact assessment to be a really wonderful course as well. Wow, that's really, really fantastic to hear, Susan, that these classes are having such an impact in your work and your learning. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I, I also thought it would be interesting for people to hear, you know, you were working full time and now you're doing the MPH degree full time. Can you say a little bit about that transition, you know, from going from a full time uh, career to um, transitioning into full time student? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I did find that the transition from full-time work to being a full-time student um, actually felt like a transition to working much more independently. Um, I found that managing a, a course load of 
seven or eight or nine courses is not unlike managing several projects all at the same time. But I was much more accustomed to being a part of a team from my nine years of working experience that preceded my year here at Hopkins. Um, so it was an adjustment and I would, I would share that with fellows just that um, it, it can sort of feel a little bit strange at first. You need a little bit of time to find your groove. Something that was very helpful to me was connecting with becoming friends with other fellows who similarly were coming from full-time experiences and had the opportunity to do the program full-time. Um, we, we could relate. We helped each other sort of become that team that we all were looking for. Um, they've become really dear friends and colleagues who I, I'm grateful to have as part of my community here in Baltimore. Um, so that was that was, I would say, the my advice for navigating that adjustment. Um, and, and ultimately, I, it's been a really good growing experience, yeah. I know, I was going to say, I think that's fantastic advice uh, for those individuals who are thinking of, of coming on full time. Susan, I have one more question for you. Um, and, you know, you talked a little bit about your, your class. <laughs> things um, you got out of um, the various courses that you mentioned. And I wondered, you know, when you do go back to work, how do you think you'll be able to apply, you know, some of the skills and training that you received? Yeah, I would say um, I'm very excited to put to use the program evaluation skills I've had the opportunity to learn here. Um, Dr. Kristen Mari's class and the fundamentals of program evaluation was a wonderful learning experience and very informative. So I've worked that into my capstone work, um, which I did in collaboration with the Montgomery County Food Council. Um, had the opportunity to learn about existing evaluation and monitoring efforts that had already been done within the organization. I learned about them more deeply than I had before um, because I was previously more involved in the advocacy and communication side of things. Um, so I look forward to putting those skills to use um, as I transition back. Um, and I would also, add that um, kind of reflecting more broadly on this whole experience here at Hopkins, I've also had the chance this year to hear how folks from a variety of backgrounds in various aspects of public health and policy, how they learn and what questions they have and what experiences they are coming from. And it's really broadened my perspective um, to see different ways that folks problem solve or or what parts of the methodology of the research they want to understand. Um, I now feel like I have a little bit better understanding of how um, some folks coming from dentistry or veterinary work or, or research um, fields that I didn't have personal professional experience in, how they approach learning and growing and also um, these public health issues that I've had the chance to learn about. So I'm excited to sort of bring that, that changed and broadened perspective to the work as well. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you, Susan. Really appreciate it. Yep. Yes, thank you. Wonderful information shared. Um, Y'all, thank you so much for, uh, for, for sharing, Susan, and, and the great questions, Faria. Um, next, we'll, we'll um, shift gears just so slightly and ask Heather to, to join in the conversation. And Heather, if you wouldn't mind, um, just start by telling us a little bit more about your work there at the Montgomery County Food Council. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion today and also to highlight the exciting work that Susan's been doing for our organization and talk about this really valuable program. Uh, so I'm the executive director of the Montgomery County Food Council. So we're a small community-based nonprofit uh, that serves as the central connection point for businesses, nonprofits, government agencies, and concerned residents um, who share a commitment to cultivating a robust, sustainable, and equitable local food system. Uh, so while we're a small organization, organization with just four staff members. Uh, we engage hundreds of partners every month um, in our working groups. Uh, so we have four working groups that focus on four main issue areas, uh, food recovery and access, food economy, food education, and environmental impact. Uh, and so we uh, bring lots of different perspectives to make sure that we have that systems-based approach to all food-related um, issues in our county. Uh, for some context, we are just outside Washington, D.C. We have a population of a about 1.1 million. And while we are um, on average one of the wealthiest counties in the country, uh, we also have tremendous income inequities and significant health disparities throughout our community. Uh, so it, obviously food system work um, is important everywhere, um, but we're really lucky that we have so much community buy-in um, in the success of, of those initiatives. Uh, my personal background is that I've been working for over 15 years in nonprofit management. Um, and so I used to work in higher ed uh, for a long time, 
doing program management and a lot of those skills have translated very effectively um, and certainly in community organizing work like what we do uh, my counseling background uh, also comes in handy sometimes uh, so it's been a really nice way to uh, get to connect some of my varied skill sets to support the needs of my community wonderful heather thank you so much and of course thank you for all the work that you all are doing in Montgomery County and you know, taking that systems approach. Um, can you uh, share with us a little bit about um, your experience thus far as a collaborating organization and what that's been like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I have nothing but really um, supportive and wonderful things to say about the experience from our organization's perspective. Um, as I shared before, we're a very small organization. Um, we have 25 council members who are dedicated volunteers. Um, and so we had had the opportunity to work with wonderful Susan um, in that in effort in the past. Um, but uh, but we are a small organization, and so it's um, it's difficult to really get people who understand what we do and have that systems based perspective and knowledge to leverage, um, while also um, you know having outside perspectives to bring to inform our work as well. So it's been a very limited commitment. It's something that uh, has not taken a lot of time, and we're you know stretched pretty thin all the time. So it's been really nice to have. Um, the the additional contributions that Susan's brought to our work. Um, and I would say just in general, having the opportunity to connect the best practices that she's learning um, through her academic work. It's been quite a while since I've been in graduate school. So sometimes when you're in grassroots work and on the ground, it can be difficult to take the time to really learn about what's happening in other parts of the country um, and apply those practices in your own communities. Wonderful. Thank you, Heather. And then um, I think you, you did a, you know, a great job of already talking about um, some of the benefits of having a Bloomberg Fellow such as Susan as a part of your organization, but um, anything else you'd like to add in regards to what it's like to have a member of your team um, as a Bloomberg Fellow? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have had Susan helping us in particular uh, with the uh, strategic planning process that our organization has been undertaking. Um, and so that's obviously a lot of um, effort uh, to coordinate that with bringing in lots of different perspectives. And it's been really helpful um, having an external expert and that outside voice coming in. But again, also somebody who understands our organization and the way that we work. Um, so it has been um, um, just really valuable to have Susan sharing her time, um, providing that, that leadership voice, um, and also supporting our efforts because as a small organization, our capacity to bring in outside consultants and, and find financial support um, to do this important work like what Susan's been doing for us is, is limited. And so we've been able to bring in additional support and um, perspective to that work. I'll also note that as a food council, um, the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future has been a really critical um, source of support and guidance for us in our growth as an organization over the past six years. And so um, having access to that expertise and that perspective in um, Susan's work with her advisory team at Hopkins has been a really unexpected and added benefit as well. Um, so we can build on um, the expertise of Hopkins to inform our work um, also. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Heather, for, for sharing all of that. And um, I ask that you stick around. We might have some questions for you. Uh, we're going to do some frequently asked questions here in just a minute. But first, um, Eli, thank you so very much for joining in on the conversation. Everyone, Eli is, like as I mentioned earlier, one of our Bloomberg American um, professors of health here at the school. Um, her affiliation is in international health, but her research focus are food systems, food just justice, community health, urban planning, health equity and disparities, and so much more. So Eli, Thank you for joining us. And if you wouldn't mind just by start off by telling us a little bit more about the work that you do here at the school. Sure, thanks so much for inviting me to join and welcome to all the viewers today. Um, I just, yeah, my, the main driver of my research really is to strengthen local policy and importantly, the policy making process to better support more equitable and healthy communities. And I strive to do this by applying an urban planning lens to challenges that impact um, the risk for obesity and community food systems. So in terms of my work, I'd say that there are three key elements to my research at the school. One is in using this uh, urban planning lens, I really try to think more expansively about the barriers to healthy eating by 
looking at the relationships and those trade-offs between food and other systems of the built environment. So for example, the relationships between food and housing systems or between food and land use decisions. Uh, number two, I really look for opportunities to align the goals of my research with the interest of community partners and also existing local government efforts. And I work both in cities here in the US and outside of the US. Um, and lastly, number three, the research itself, of course, offers many different learning opportunities. So I'm always keen to think about um, how to involve and integrate students in my work. Absolutely wonderful. And so, uh, folks, as we talked about earlier through the, in the presentation, uh, we have both traditional and what we um, kind of coin as non-traditional organizations and fellows. And these are folks who haven't taken your um, typical trajectory to public health. And we're really excited about connecting with those applicants and those organizations. Um, one particular area that we're looking to expand our reach into um, this year, and we'll be doing a lot of presentations and outreach, is the field of urban planning um, and planning in general, because we know that there's so many different ways that the work we're doing here at the initiative and the ways of public health intersect with planning. So Eli, I know you talked about that a little bit. Um, can you uh, dive a little bit deeper into how urban planning and public health intersect? Yeah, it's actually a, a very timely question. Uh, in fact, public health and the urban planning fields historically once worked quite closely together to mitigate the spread of infectious diseases um, in cities, and this started around the 1850s. Uh, but even today, they intersect more than we think. So if we take the food system, for example, and think about all the parts that are needed to promote healthy eating, uh, you need soil and water to grow fruits and vegetables and planning decisions related to development affect land use and water infrastructure. To distribute food from farms to food processors or from farms to schools, restaurants and food retailers, you need an effective transportation system and planning affects those decisions. Um, to buy food at the community or household level, you need money to do that and planning decisions affect economic development and income generation activities. Um, and then just to close the loop, if you think about food loss and food related waste, planning affects waste management decisions. And so I think the two fields, um, they're both very forward thinking and have strengths that complement each other very nicely. And so just in a nutshell, I think urban planning decisions really shape the environments and the communities in which we live, work, and play. So it's certainly relevant in the space related to food systems, um, but I think there's really tremendous opportunity um, in some sense to rejoin the two fields again. Absolutely. And um, we have that opportunity for you, for you who are watching right now through our Bloomberg Fellows Program um, and for organizations who are tuning in um, there are opportunities for you as well. So please, as Shannon mentioned earlier on, um, send us an email, reach out to us. Um, if we don't reach out to you, um, it, you know, before you can connect with us, but please, um, we're excited about the opportunities to start to bring them back together. Um, the final question at, uh, at this point, Eli, I, I would just ask um, if you can talk a little bit more about how faculty, um, particularly, particularly through the initiative, but how faculty work and collaborate with students, organizations, um, or communities in your work? Sure, so um, one area of my work, for example, uh, through the initiative is looking at how a collaborative governance model can inform food systems change at the local level. So here in Baltimore, for example, I'm working with the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative, as well as with colleagues at the Center for Livable Future to evaluate the impact of what's called the Resident Food Equity Advisor Program. And this is a cohort of resident advisors who go through a series of capacity building workshops and then in developing a task force, drive decision-making around food. So this year, the advisors are working with the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative to propose strategies to improve access to healthy foods in both existing and potentially future public family housing communities in Baltimore City. 
So this works also in partnership with the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. So we have a lot of different partners on this project. And then my role, um, and I'm also uh, working with a student on this project, is to document and evaluate this collaborative governance model and process in this context of trying to mitigate those trade-offs between uh, housing and food that are especially challenging for lower income households. Wow, that's amazing. And the project sounds very impactful and looking forward to following the progress that you all um, continue to make in that project. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and for participating today in this session. Sure. So um, now that you've heard from these amazing participants and a little bit more about the initiative, I bet your next question is how you can apply, right? So you wanna be a part of this. You wanna be a fellow and learn more about how you can use the lens of public health to further and deepen your impact. And I bet Faria can do just that and tell you how you can apply. Yes, I sure can. Well, first of all, I wanna let everyone know that in early August on the initiative's website, we will be announcing the next call for our fellowship applications. And at that time, uh, you will be able to uh, download our fellowship application forms on our website. And that is when we will begin accepting applications for the next cycle. And in terms of how to apply, so applicants would apply to both the MPH program and the fellowship program together at the same time. For the MPH, please review their requirements, their admissions requirements, which you will find on their website. And they have very explicit instructions on how to submit your MPH admissions materials. Everything, including your transcripts, your essay, et cetera, everything will be submitted through SOFAS. And SOFAS is the name of the application processing system that the Bloomberg School uses. So all of your MPH admissions materials will be submitted through SOFAS. At the same time, you also need to submit your fellowship application forms. And we have two forms, one for the collaborating organization and the other form is the applicant form. And so you can find those on our website starting in early August. Just download them, complete the forms, and those have to be submitted on our website. And those are, in a nutshell, what you need to do, the steps you need to take to apply to the fellowship and the MPH program. I also want to let everyone know that the deadline for submitting both your fellowship application and your MPH application materials will be December 1st. And matriculation for those applicants who apply then will be um, June 2021. Okay. And so now I think that we are going to show a video of one of our fellows, Mila Neira, who graduated um, two years ago. She was among the eight inaugural Bloomberg Fellows, and we wanted to share with you a video of the work that she, she's doing in the obesity focus area. It's a supersized crisis. Americans are not winning their battle against obesity. Nearly 7% of middle school children are severely obese. Obesity is a result of poor nutrition and a food environment that has limited access to healthy and affordable foods. It means that you don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, and when you do, you cannot afford to buy those. With the help of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, I'm now able to help communities improve their nutrition and their food security. Every week we have a farm share that allows us to provide fresh, affordable produce to patients and people in the community. The issue with the food system, it's so critical and I truly believe that it is possible to fix it. We have to look at the big picture and think about all of the health inequities that are really affecting low-income communities. The Bloomberg American Health Initiative provides that network between students, faculty, researchers, and organizations and brings them all together. That's really important for people. You know, that's really important to prevent obesity. It's always so exciting to see the work of our fellows and uh, work Mila is doing is, is making a direct impact. And, 
Um, we know that you might have some questions for us. Um, hopefully we can get through some of the frequently asked questions that maybe would come up for you. If not, please reach out to us, Bloomberg Fellows, MPH at jhu.edu, and we will return any question that we get in a very timely manner. So never hesitate to reach out should you have any questions. Um, the first question, Fari, I think um, I will um, ask for you to, to chime in, but um, this particular is a question is one that we often get. Um, I've been out of school for 10 years and haven't taken any type of academic courses in that time frame. Uh, what should I know to prepare for my application? Well, that's a great question and also quite a common question. And I would say most of our fellows have been out of school for a long time, 10 years, 15 years, and some even longer than that. And what I tell everyone is to speak with the MPH program to understand better their admissions requirements, particularly their prerequisites, because they do require courses like biology and math, especially if you have been out of school for a long time. So it's important for applicants to, to chat with the MPH program, um, and they will, um, specifically, they will be able to tell them which prerequisites that they need to take. And prerequisites have to be completed before um, a student can matriculate in June. So that's really important. Yeah, thank you, Faria. Another question that folks often ask us is, what are you looking for in an applicant? Mm -hmm. Yes, another common question. So, you know, we look at your entire application, everything you submit for the MPH program, and of course your fellowship forms, but we really place the greatest weight on what you and your organization say in your fellowship application forms. We want to know all about your work, your accomplishments, and what you see yourself doing once you receive your MPH degree and what kind of potential impact you think you will make having this training. Uh, we want to know why being a fellow is important to you. Uh, we also want to hear uh, from your organization. So what they say is just as important as what the applicant says. So um, your organization should talk about you and your work, your experience, your potential. Um, what they envision you doing once you complete the MPH program, um, your potential impact on the community and making positive changes. So these are the most important things um, that we look for when we review our applications. Great. Um, and I think we have a question for Susan. So as we discussed earlier, um, and you yourself have been out of school for a number of years before coming back and, and yeah. doing program, um, a lot of folks want to know about what supports are available or what students can um, expect, to, you know, after being out of school for so long and, and how they can prepare to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the case for me, um, being out of, out of school for some time, as you briefly mentioned, Shane. Um, so I worked for about nine years prior to coming back and working on my MPH here at Hopkins. Um, it certainly was, I would say for me, um, there was a bit of an adjustment when it came to my science classes, particularly epidemiology, because I um, don't have much of a science background. So that was mostly new territory for me um, and very much a learning experience. But I'm grateful to say that the initiative um, supports free tutoring for fellows. And I was able to avail myself of that opportunity. And it was extremely helpful. I wound up getting a lot out of that course and really taking away so much from it. And it wound up being a very positive learning experience for me. And I actually found myself helping some of my colleagues and friends prepare for tests later on in the term. So I'm very happy to say that the tutoring was helpful and effective. So that was a wonderful support that I'm grateful I had access to. Wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. And you know there there are many opportunities to to find those supports, and we're always um, looking for ways to support the fellows. Another way that uh, the initiative can support fellows is through some small grant programs, um, applied experience awards, travel awards. There's a variety of ways that we look to um, take innovative approaches to supporting students and fellows in their work. So. Um, thank you, um, Susan, for sharing that. Uh, oh, and Jane, um, I just wanted to add uh, something to that. Another uh, way the initiative supports our fellows is through academic support. 
So um, if a fellow needs tutoring in a particular course or something, they need only to ask and uh, we are more than happy to provide tutoring uh, for anyone who may need it um, uh, at no cost. Absolutely. Um, Farah, another question that I feel um, comes in quite frequently is asking about any types of restrictions that are um, on for the organizations. Um, well, you know, the basic eligibility for organizations is that they are based here in the U.S. and that they are working in at least one of the five focus areas. If they meet these criteria, then they are eligible. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we have many different types of organizations, and I named a few. And, um, you know, we have from public health departments to um, a public library. Um, you know, and small community groups. So there really aren't any restrictions um, as long as they meet that criteria of being based here in the U.S. and working in at least one of the focus areas. It really can be any type of organization. Absolutely. And Heather, I think this is a good segue um, to, to you. Another common concern or uh, organizations or fellows will reach out and they they always want to know what's the catch um, you know there's a, the free fellowship program um, organizations are concerned you know do I have to pay for part of that fellowship you know what what catches there um, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about that absolutely uh, well I guess if you define a catch as getting a really experienced insightful and talented person on your team uh, for a while then that would be it uh, but that's that's exactly what our experience has been uh, obviously there are um, some small requirements uh, with working with the fellow on their um, plans uh, for how they spend their time with you um, and providing feedback to the program on how the experience has been for you um, there's really been nothing but tremendous support um, from, uh, from the team at Hopkins on navigating the experience. I've felt um, supported the entire time. Any questions that I had were answered promptly and any concerns were immediately addressed. Um, and so the best part is once Susan has all of this um, terrific experience and knowledge under her belt um, and building on the work that she's already done, really um, enhancing our evaluation strategies and, and setting some of our strategic goals for our organization, we'll get to work together for another year. Um, and so that is in a paid full-time capacity um, for our organization, uh, but get to bring that expertise to really um, enhance our work uh, further. So uh, so I think it's been uh, a very minimal time commitment. And so even for a small organization, it was very manageable um, and really does allow us to leverage that academic experience and to our on-the-ground efforts. Um, and so we're uh, really excited to, to continue our work together with uh, with a really, um, really terrific person. So couldn't be more excited about it going forward. Absolutely. And thank you so much for that. Um, you know, if you're watching and your organization is giving any pushback or you have any concerns, uh, reach out directly to us, Bloomberg Fellows, mph at jhu.edu, directly to Faria or myself. And we'd be more than happy to discuss um, with you or with your organization what this looks like. Um, we do that frequently in our more than happy uh, to have that conversation. Uh, another question, Faria, is mm -hmm. um, if uh, an applicant does not get into the MPH program, are they still able to, um, to become a Bloomberg Fellow? Well, for those applicants who um, did not get admission the first time around, I would say, you know, um, please try again. Um, the MPH program, welcomes applicants to reapply. And um, I suggest sp speaking with them to find out a little bit more about um, their application and how they can strengthen it. Sometimes it means um, taking a statistics course. Sometimes it could mean retaking the GRE, but it's really helpful for people to speak with the MPH program to get some constructive feedback on their application and what they can do to strengthen it if they want, would like to apply again. And I'd just like to say we, we have had applicants in the past who at first didn't get admitted to the MPH program. Um, they took a specific course 
or they took their GRE again, and the second time around they were admitted and they were also selected for the fellowship program. Of course, there are no guarantees, but I always encourage people, um, you know, to, to learn a little bit more about how they can strengthen their application. Um, and it, it has worked for uh, people in the past, so, so don't give up. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all and thanks um, for, for addressing some of these very frequent questions. If we didn't get to your questions, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to respond. Thank you, thank you, Shane, and, and thank you to the participants. Um, I, I am excited to share how you all are able to stay connected with us, to um, stand, stand um, by for updates with the initiative, and to also get some more information on when the actual application uh, will be announced. Um, there are many ways in which you can stay connected. Um, we have our American Health Dispatch, which is a weekly newsletter. It goes out every Friday and it has tons of news about the initiative, new research, uh, what our fellows are doing. Um, we recently rolled out a series, Fellows on the Front Lines, and we are um, telling the stories of fellows who are on the ground in communities um, working around COVID-19. Um, so if you haven't subscri subscribed already, we welcome you to do so, um, just to stay informed with all things um, American Bloomberg American Health Initiative related. We also have our website um, that has tons of resources. We have toolkits, policy briefings, articles where we share stories about our fellows and faculty. Um, we also have a YouTube channel. Um, we started it not long ago. Um, we have over 100 videos and playlists that include um, panels and interviews from our Bloomberg American Health Summit. Um, it has seminars. We have um, just about everything, webinars. You'll be able to find a recording of this um, on our YouTube channel as well. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. Um, and lastly, our uh, Twitter. So we, we actively tweet uh, daily. Um, please stay up to date um, with um, our Twitter account. It, you know, it's currently, it's always evolving. Um, and one thing um, that I did want to point out is our American Health Podcast, which you can also subscribe through our website. Um, the podcast is amazing. We have tons of stories, um, tons of podcasts that dive deeper into public health issues that are um, impacting the country and impacting our communities. Uh, most recently, we're working on a series that um, uh, is highlighting COVID-19 and how the five focus areas in which we um, address, we're looking at the intersection of COVID-19 in the focus areas. And I think the first one um, is looking at violence. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our podcast channel as well. So we have tons of ways in which you all can stay connected and we welcome you to reach out and, and just stay involved. And um, if you have any questions, let us know. So I think that concludes our uh, webinar on the obesity and the food systems uh, focus area. Um, again, I just wanna say a special thank you to Heather, Eli, Susan, Faria, Shane um, for joining us today and sharing all of the informative, important information um, today. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you again and everyone enjoy the rest of your day.